Vice Chancellor, Engineer Professor Osase Farade Oromese, fellow Nigerian Society of Engineers, ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Professor Pius Iriwogwe, other principal officers of the university, Provost, Deans, and Directors, Emeritus Professors, visiting Vice Chancellors from sister institutions. The CMD, your BTH, your Royal INSs, top government functionaries, staff and students, invited guests, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome every one of you to today's inaugural lecture. This is the 190th in the inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin to be delivered by Professor Alfred Ogwawo Ogbemudia. <clears throat> Topic, Corpus Orthopedus Erga Omnes, Seasons and Salutary Symbiosis for Earthy Movement. May I humbly invite the Registrar O.A. Oshode Mrs. ably represented by the Deputy Registrar, Mr. Adodo, to introduce the Vice Chancellor and members of the Vice Chancellor's procession. The Registrar. <laughs> Distinguished guests, invitees, students, ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to the 190th in the inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin. Please permit me to rest on the existing protocol already observed by the University PRO. As I introduce the Vital Slots Entourage, which is ably uh, led by the Vital Slot Professor FFO Ponwese, who is ably represented here by the Dep Deputy Vital Slot Academics Professor Pius E. Iruogbe. Others in the Vital Slots Entourage include Professor George E. Eria Iremu, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Ekemo Campus. <laughs> we also have representing the BOSA, Dr. Papabila, Mr. D. E. H. <laughs> On the other side of the desk, we have Provost Deans and Directors. Representing the Provost College of Medical Sciences, we have Professor E. P. Garo. The Dean of Students, Professor O.P. Osadolo. The host Dean School of Medicine, we have Professor M.I. Momo. Dean Faculty of Agric, Professor M.A. Bamikoli. Representing the Dean of Arts, we have Dr. E. Aru Adeliki. Professor D. Aru Adeliki. Dean School of Basic Medical Sciences, we have Professor Mrs. H.A. Obu. <laughs> Dean School of Dentistry, we have Professor O.N. Obuekwe. <laughs> Dean Faculty of Engineering, we have Professor F.A. Aysen. <laughs> Dean of Law, we have Professor N.A. Inegwedi. Representing the Dean of Management Sciences, we have Dr. A. Tafame. Also representing Dean of Faculty of Pharmacy, we have Professor Ray Osorwa. Dean of Faculty of Physical Sciences, we have Professor S. E. Omosiwo. Director of Institute of Child Health, we have Professor Mrs. Sado. Director Center for Part-Time Program, we have Professor Mrs. K. A. Elafuna. <laughs> Director Distance Learning Program, we have Professor F. E. Omori. <laughs> Director ICT CRP, we have Professor F. O. Ekaisen. <laughs> it is now my singular honor to invite the Vice Chancellor to introduce the inaugural lecturer of the day, the Vice Chancellor. <laughs> to be reading this uh, address this afternoon. 
So today is actually an historic day for many reasons. Uh, the Lingua Grand Lecturer for today is my classmate. And we, I remember the day we, we came into this university with our suitcases, you know, to, to begin the medical school. So it's quite uh, emotional for me to be the one to give. I told them I may not give you the medal, just keep it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, we have been together. Uh, you know, we have uh, shared garden together in Hotiri. We play chess together, play draft together, and go to the dissection room. It might also interest you to know that Obamuda is a footballer, just like me, but I'm a better footballer than he is. <laughs> So uh, he, he, he plays defense for our, you know, our own team that was you know, our own level in the medical school, whereas I was an attacker. <laughs> so, uh, so I think uh, I'm so happy to be here to deliver this address. Uh, the vice chancellor would have loved to come himself, but we have been having a council meeting, which is still going on now. So this is the first uh, meeting of the council. So we were thinking of coming here I then go back, but the popular move was that I should come and represent the vice chancellor. The meeting is going on now. So I will read the address uh, of the vice chancellor, Professor Friday, uh, Faraday, Friday Sase Ruense, fellow Nigerian Society of Engineers. Principal officers of the University of Benin, members of Senate, Provost, College of Medical Sciences, deans of faculties and schools, directors of institutes, Professors and members of council, my lord, spiritual and temporal, staff and students of the University of Benin, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you all to the 190th inaugural lecture of the University of Benin. Today's lecture is the fourth talk to be delivered in my tenure as the vice chancellor of this university, the 40th lecture to be delivered in the College of Medical Sciences, and the 31st in the School of Medicine, University of Benin. I'm glad to inform you that the 2016, 2017 second semester lectures are going on smoothly with staff and students doing the needful. I sincerely solicit for the cooperation of all stakeholders in ensuring that the goals of this academic session are successfully attained in order to move the University of Benin forward. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me at this juncture to introduce to you our lecturer for today. He is Professor Alfred Obogo Obamudia. The title of his lecture is Corpus Orthopedus Ega Omnis, Seasons and the Salutary Symbiosis for Healthy Movement. I know many people are wondering what is happening, but don't worry, that's why he's here. He'll give us a lecture. <laughs> Professor Alfred Ogogo was born on the 23rd of July 1966 at Abudu, Edo State, to late Pa Eko Obamudia and late Mrs. R.O.B. Obamudia. He attended the lower primary school Uselu and Obasiki Memorial Primary School Abudu before proceeding to the Banker Grammar School Banker. He obtained the West African School Certificate in 1983 and gained admission to the University of Benin in the same year to study medicine and surgery and obtained the MBBS in 1989. He had his mandatory internship at the University of Benin Teaching Hospital and served as NYC medical officer in the Royal Hospital, Jauri, from May 1992 to August 1993. Professor Bamudia had a seat with General Hospital Agungu in Kebi State for a year before joining the University of Benin Teaching Hospital for an residency training in September 1993. He was appointed a consultant orthopedic surgeon and traumatologist in UBT in 2002 and lecturer one in the University of Benin in 2004, rising through the ranks to become a professor in 2014. His area of specialization is orthopedics and trauma. Professor Bamudia is currently the head of the Department of Orthopedics and Trauma, UBTH. He has held academic and administrative positions within and outside the university, such as part-time demonstrating anatomy, College of Medical Sciences, 
1995 to 1999. First Vice President, National Association of Resident Doctors of Nigeria, 1995 to 1996. President, National Association of Resident Doctors of Nigeria, 1998 to 1999. Eternal Auditor, Nigerian Medical Association, by State, 2001. Chairman, Nigerian Medical Association, the State, 2002 to 2004. Honorary Consultant, Autopedic and Trauma, UBTH, 2004 to date. Vice Chair, Vision Right Protection Committee, 2004 to 2007. Chairman, Theater Users Committee, 2004 to 2014. Okay. Osgari Coordinator, UBTH, 2006 to 2007. Chairman, Long Service Award Committee, 2007. Chairman, Drug Revolving Fund, 2008 to 2014. Chairman, Surgical Implant Revolving Fund, 2010 to 2014. Coordinator, FGM Environmental Hospital Rehabilitation Program, UBTA, 2008 to 2014. Director, Clinical Services and Training, UBTA, 2008 to 2014. Chairman Medical Advisory Committee, Director of Clinical Services and Training, UBTH, 2010 to 2014. Chairman UBT Group of Schools Management Committee, 2012 to date. Also, has supervised many undergraduate and postgraduate students and has served as an examiner and assessor to several universities and postgraduate bodies in different institutions within and outside the country. He has attended several local and international conferences, seminars, workshops, within and outside Nigeria to present papers or attend uh, training programs. He has contributed to the advancement of knowledge with over 40 publications in both local and international. <laughs> Book chapters and conference proceedings. He is also a review of articles for publications in peer review journals. Also, when is a member, Board of Trustees, Dr. Owen Jackson of Basaki Foundation, February 2011 to date, and he is the Secretary, Board of Studies, Board of Trustees, Jonathan Asin O'Connor for Foundation, August 2013 to date. He is also a member and fellow of several associations and professional bodies such as the Nigerian Medical Association, Medical and Dental Consultant Association of Nigeria, Nigeria Anthropedic Association, West African College of Surgeons, as well as AO Spine International. Moreover, he is a member of the Nigerian Institute of Management and holds a master's degree in public administration from the University of Guinea. He is a recipient of awards and special recognitions, such as Meritorial Service Award by the Association of Resident Doctors in UBTH 1997, Best Lecturer Award in Surgery by the University of Benin in 2006. Meritorious Service Award by Nigerian Medical Association, Edo State in 2004. Merit Award for Excellence by UBTH in 2006. And the Oba Eredi Award for Professional Excellence in Medicine, 2011. Professor Bermuda is a devout Christian. His hobbies include experimental farming, culinary menu creation, learning languages, playing chess, darts, table tennis, and golf. He is happily married to Dr. Mrs. Ehimwema Ubermudia, a cardiologist, and their union is blessed with children. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to invite Professor Alfred Ubermudia, a professor of orthopedics and traumatology, to deliver his honor. Society of Engineers 
and his entourage, including the deputy that is presented here today by my friend and deputy vice chancellor, academic professor of Pius Ehiawa Kwan Irogwe, and the other the deputy vice chancellor of Pius Ehiawa campus, the, that is the provost of the College of Medicine, Professor B.I. Yahweh, represented by Professor E.P. Garoro, the Dean of the School of Medicine, my host dean, and my teacher, Professor M.I. Momo, and other deans and directors, the Chief Medical Director of the University of Benin Teaching Hospital, Professor M.O. Ibadin, and other principal officers of the hospital, Chief Executives of other federal institutions, former principal officers of the university and affiliated teaching hospitals, my royal fathers, my teachers past and present, colleagues, friends, family, benefactors, and let guys, of course, I have not been so schooled in uh, the issue of protocol, but I would like to adopt the protocol as enunciated by the University PRO, but before I do that, I would like to recognize the, the presence of the, of the Governor, His Excellency, Godwin Nogegase Obaseki, represented by Mr. Ake Sayande, in charge of DPP in the Governor's Office. You're welcome, Your Excellency. I also recognize the Students' Union Government, Great Unibem! Great Unibem! Members of the Fourth Estate of the Realm, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, this lecture shall afford me a once in a lifetime opportunity to be effus effusively and expansively grateful to God and the so many benefactors He has used to propel me forwards and upwards. The topic for today, as you already are aware, is corpus or tupidus erga omnes, seasons and the salutary symbiosis for healthy movement. This was chosen to enable me to discuss issues that will be beneficial to all. I humbly invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to this excursion through the account of my work as a clinician and academician. I thank you for your attention. This lecture is dedicated to God Almighty for the principal gift of his spirit of life and to my wife, Dr. Mrs. Ahimema Obamudia, who meritoriously added to her wifely roles the responsibilities of my mother, who passed on eight days after our wedding. Also dedicated to my benefactors, who freely gave me of a massive chunk indeed of their hard-earned knowledge, wisdom, understanding, influence, and affluence to bring me into the luminous presence of wholesome enlightenment. And of course to my patients, orthopedic patients for that matter, for their uncommon forbearance and the opportunity to be a part of their return to healthy movement. The acknowledgement here, if I choose to dwell on it completely, it takes 60 days. And I have 60 minutes. So you will permit me to skip a number of things. And one thing that I am happy about is the evolutionary powers of apology. Once you say apologies and present your apologies before kind hearted men and women, your sins are forgiven. So I apologize ahead to those that whose names will not be mentioned to know that it's not it's an act of omission rather than commission. I take full responsibility for this because the devils have been exorcised from the printing press. <laughs> I cannot now say it's a printer's devil. To God Almighty, the power behind the regularity of seasons, times, and signs for all its benefits that have been beyond my full comprehension. In spite of the paucity of personal merit, I am indeed very grateful. My father, for the many sacrifices he made to provide the platform that brought me this far, I wish he was here. My mother, who under the direction of the Almighty took my embryonic hands through the dimly lit and convoluted passage 
from eternity into this realm of existence. And thereafter, I backed on the adverse task of making me whole. I'm very grateful. And my parents in law for the adult part of my upbringing. And to the Vice Chancellor of this university for the opportunity to deliver this lecture and other privileges that I have continued to enjoy. And the immediate past Vice Chancellor Professor OGO Shodi for the prompt promotions. And you, know, you all know the social and financial benefits attached to prompt promotions. And I'm indeed very grateful. My own, and I will just mention two names to capture the entire list of arms. Mrs. Vigo I. Wajai and Mrs. Veronica Idemudia for replacing and playing a major role in other motherly needs that I had that my wife could not provide. I'm indeed very grateful. I'm also grateful to Barrister J. Arimie son, my maternal uncle, for his care for my siblings from then till now. I thank His Royal Majesty of Monoba, Nedo, Uku, Apolopolo, Obaiwai for His Royal Beneficence. I'm grateful to His Royal Highness, Enuki of Ewobanosa, Enuki Professor G.I. Akinzwa for his fatherliness from the time he accepted to chair the annual dinner of the Magistrates Club, Uniben, in 1989 now. <laughs> a club that I served as Secretary and President as a medical student. I'm grateful to His Royal Highness Enuki of Ogada Prince Ewan Sefei Yewa Efo Eweka for his beneficence, including those offered in the course of the hospice for my late father. My, the Enuki of Ogada is Enuki of the place I call my ancestral home, because that's where my progenitors uh, came from after immigrating from Obelaka in the, in the days of Obai Hemuda. I'm, I'm grateful to Professor Via Yahweh and through him to the Dean, Professor M. 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 Momo, for the tutelage at, and, and, and along the years at different stages of my career and numerous other benefits. I remain forever grateful to other deans and provosts, particularly Professor F. E. Okonofa, who was provost when I was made a lecturer in 2004, and Professor E. Obiasu, who was dean in 2014 when I was promoted to the post, post of professor. Now I will mention a few names and they will represent all my teachers. Professor Emeritus Aro Febu, a teacher of teachers. Professor B.F.A. Umebese, who taught me orthopedics. Professor M.I. Momo, Dr. M.E. Ubeye, and a host of others for the skills they repeated to me that brought me this far. And I also want to thank Ehimema, my wife. She looks as none would look the beauty's queen from the passionate thing written by Shakespeare. <laughs> my, my counselor, my confidant, angel of light, whose presence writings any degree of gloom and my substantive mother, I'm monumentally indebted in terms of gratitude for the innumerable blessings God has wrought in my life using you and your means. I'm indeed grateful. I can only love you more. I thank Osase, Osaome, Se, and Etions, our children, for the joy they provide and the desire they do, to do more that they activate and the future they unfold. You are blessed in your bodies and spirits. And now, like I said earlier, I think I should have reached this. And let everybody here know that I'm grateful to my benefactors, known and unknown. But before closing this chapter, I would like to mention the indelible contributions of late Dr. Omwem Yugye Jackson, I am a Paseki, the former president of the Omwem Jackson of Paseki Foundation, and then the current president, Dr. Jackson Gaius of Paseki, for all the benefits that the foundation allowed me to enjoy, and all other benefactors. I thank them on behalf of all other benefactors, all my teachers, and my friends and colleagues, so that we can move on. Because I do know that there are persons who have come here, like the Vice Chancellor has said through the DVC Academy, to find out what is it about purpose 
Otopidos Elga Omnes, that Ubermudia has to say. And if I continue do, to dwell on acknowledgement, a number of persons will leave here disappointed. It is quite possible for me to say thank you and apologize to those I know, but I don't think I know everybody in this audience to apologize to those who will be disappointed. So gentlemen and ladies, allow me to move on. All that things in the acknowledgement session will be seen in the booklet, as well as my, my previous two books, The Guardian Manuscript, Truth, the Shadows and Prismatic Reflections, and Words, Spirituality, Essence, and a Natural Book. I will have to deliver this lecture as enunciated in this slide. The chapters are there. Now let's go into the introduction to the title. I am humbled and elated to have the opportunity to deliver the one night of the inaugural lecture series of the prestigious and great University of Benin. The topic, as you're already aware, came to mind and it appeared up to me at, con at conception and now. It is the duty of making it so that became my challenge. A Greco-Latin-English complex of the heading was chosen to celebrate the complex admixture of several arts and expressions of science in orthopedics and orthopedic trauma care. The compound Greco-Latin component of this complex heading in three languages could well have been written in Benin. After all, except officers, courtiers, or proselytes in the temple of linguistics, how many would bother about the difference between the Greco-Latin and Benin heading in present-day Nigeria? Well, the, this is no longer printer's devil. We now have a situation where there's no current in the laptop. So I'll carry on. Now, the basis for the choice The English interpretation of this title is The Body of Work in Orthopedics for All Seasons and the Salutary Symbiosis for Healthy Movement. The understanding here is that the word corpus is a Latin word meaning a body or collection of literary works. And orthopedus is a word derived of Greek origin from two stems, autos for straight and pedos for child, but now presently used to define a branch of surgery called orthopedic surgery. And of course, ega omnes is a Latin phrase meaning for all. And so put together, it tells you that the topic we have today, transliterated into English, will mean a body of works in orthopedics for all colon, seasons, and the salutary symbiosis for healthy movement. And you may well allow me to continue to use that until, until the system comes back to normal. Now essentially, Title to the topic, the, to the, the yes. The, so, orthopedics, the Nigerian orthopedic surgeon's surgical experience is incomplete. The Nigerian orthopedic surgeon's surgical experience is incomplete. Flowing contact with deformities, and you do know we do know that how people perceive us this is a part of Benin that says 
I saw Queen do bull. Because you may not have been prepared to, to cut through an Iroko, so what we are seeing is part of it. Maybe I didn't pray hard enough. <laughs> now, the orthopedic surgeons, the Nigerian orthopedic surgeon surgical experience is uh, actually tied to a lot of deformities, and trauma related deformities are the most uh, common. How people per perceive us or how we feel about ourselves depends largely on the form our lives assume, whether in passivity or in activity. A, a few patients may actually end up with what you regard as a whistling gate. I've defined the whistling gate as the gate that announces the arrival of a patient long before the patient enters the scene without the aid of the talking drum. We expect, therefore, that the restoration of limb length alignment for the orthopedic surgeon to come cosmetic and functional stage may be to ensure good gait and form is an unavailable goal in practice. The natural disposition which is necessary to be a good student and practitioner of any branch of medicine is expected to have an artistic connotation in some specialties. As it is written in the canon, a work among the Hippocratic corpus that for a man to be truly suited for, to practice medicine, he must be possessed of a natural disposition for it, necessary instruction, favorable circumstances, industry, and time. The first requisite is a natural disposition for a reluctant student renders every effort vain. Therefore, the surgical components of, of duties offered by orthopedic surgeons are compared to be conducted in symbiotic relationships amidst the influence of metallurgy, science of tissue regeneration, and his or innate artistry, the results are to be functionally and cosmetically accept acceptable. This relationship between the end products of metallurgy, innate artistry of the surgeon on one hand, and the orthopedic surgical science on the other, in my opinion, is a salutary symbiotic relationship. And that's the reason behind the title we have today, the salutary symbiosis for healthy movement. And I need to note that this symbiosis cannot make meaning in the absence of modern day anesthesia because surgery in the absence of modern day anesthesia will be a class art in pay savagery. Anesthesia now has advanced from the days of yore when adults were required to hold down the patient for surgery now to a point where you can operate on the upper limbs with the patient awake and safety ensured. And this has been shown in a work done by Professor uh, Imari Jaya Singo and Okwemudia Eho. Teamwork. This is a requisite in order to restore healthy movement. You can see in this slide you have the radiographer, the anesthetist, the team of surgeons, and the scrub nurse. This teamwork is something that gradually is now steadily being eroded by interprofessional squabbles, like the mythological squabble among the digits of a hand for superiority that will end in functional incapacitation. And it's, we will get back to that, because it's important that we address that by, before the end of this lecture. My reliance on implants and other metallurgical devices in order to create an enabling environment for nature to bring to bear its regenerative capacities are revealed by surgical science and the artistic connotation in my practice will be evident as we pour through my contribution to the body of knowledge in the field of orthopedic surgery and traumatology. This lecture could also be seen as a summary of my team's response to operational challenges in the course of an academic and clinical autopsy and a documentation of outcomes of interventions on a number of musculoskeletal maladies. In this lecture, we will also relate our research work directly or tangentially to prevention of fractures as age advances. This is an area of orthopedics that should be frequently considered for the benefit of the society and hopefully not to the chagrin of those who would lose patronage. My season, the seasons and salutary symbiosis. 
a season is a part of a year. However, this part of the lecture will read on the seasons of life generally after my season. The initial part of my season, birth, upbringing, education, growth, I think have been dealt with satisfactorily in the, in the citation. I'll just offer a, a few, a, a, a short insight into how I came into being an orthopedic surgeon. I don't think I entered medical school thinking of being an orthopedic surgeon. I just knew I was in medical school to get MBBS. I was under Professor Emeritus Arrow of Febu at the time I passed my Part 1 fellowship examination. And considering the finesse and meticulousness he brought to the job, I proposed in my heart to emulate him. Thereafter, I was posted to work under Professor Uo Simen of blessed memory as a senior registrar. He engraved the values of hemostasis on my psyche somewhere in my being without the chance of erasure. After six months with him, I literally sat down at the crossroad as a fascinating junction of decision. That it was at this fascinating junction of decision that a third option came up when Professor FPF in December 1987 called me to his office and said, and I quote, I want you to uh, from my observations during your junior courses, I, will, I think you will make a good orthopedic surgeon. I want you to come to orthopedics and trauma for your part two training. Ah, I said to him, give me some time, sir. The porcupine, upon realizing that of his inability to run speedily, chose to grow tongues instead of hair. So my first thought of being an orthopedic surgeon faded away when I studied my frame in the mirror and looked at it and compared with the frames of Dr. O.N. Owain and Professor Mebese, whose mid and circumference were simply gargantuan. <laughs> at best, after a few days, I recall that Professor P.F. O'Reilly taught me in 1987 stroke 88, and I realized that his frame not, was not too far from mine. So I returned a few days later to let him know that I have accepted the invitation. If O'Reilly could do it, then I should be able to knowing fully well that there must be something in the muscle of the person not so endowed with science that can make him be him or her be a good orthopedic surgeon. And so, from January 1st, 1988, I jumped into orthopedics and trauma with all the vigor that I had and that I could muster and found out after all that the bones were not as hard as I thought. The name of the specialty seemed to have brought more resilience into my system as I walked day, night and in between as the only senior registrar to two equally demanding consultants. <laughs> Professor Mepese's fatherly approach made the service of two masters with great expectation, enchantingly and seamlessly possible. In addition to my training as an orthopedic surgeon in UBTH, I also spent a year in the National Orthopedic Hospital in Kobe and had some short stints in Clinican, the Lander Hofstad Germany, as well as the Center for Spine and Scoliosis Surgery in Vogue Tarot Germany. Now the general seasons of life, we'll come back to this, but it's important to note that every season in life is important. The seasons of, however, the seasons in musculoskeletal life should be taken seriously. The strength of bones in adulthood is dependent on muscle activity and the strength of muscles is in turn dependent on innervation. Therefore, whenever there is no neurologic impediment, all muscles should be exercised actively and sufficiently in order to have enough calcium deposits in bones to finance the depreciation that will inexorably arise in each person's bone bank balance as aging consumes youthfulness. In the seasons of life, therefore, exercise is the single most important deposit required to maintain a positive bone bank balance. Belated intake of calcium supplements, as we are now used to doing, after years of sedentary living, we only have the results similar to those expected in, a, in an infant wind with beans. Now, naturally, if you win an infant with beans, most times the, the fecal matter will look like beans, completely undigested. And that's the same way the calcium we take when we don't have the capacity to use all, we end up as, as stones in, in the kidney. So it's important, therefore, to build a bone bank balance so that you don't need so much of calcium supplements to maintain your bone stock. We'll come to that shortly. The salutary symbiosis. This is 
my own observation, I had observed the symbiotic relationship between orthopedic surgical science on the one hand and the science of pathology, like I've mentioned earlier. I also observed that there are other symbioses that people don't seem to see. You know, you, they, they, like the symbiosis I showed you in the theater that you call teamwork. You have the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, and the orthopedic surgeon as the visible ones. And then the visible ones being the perioperative nurse, anesthetist, and orthopedic surgeon. These are the symbioses we'll be looking at as we move on. Now let's deal with the first part of my work, musculoskeletal trauma, internal fixation, and aid to union of fractures. Musculoskeletal trauma forms a core component of the issues that orthopedic surgeons have to deal with. The scourge will be far less if we pay attention to the basic rules of daily living, as shown by Edie Kameno and Ubangudia Eko. And it is said that if we have a high obedience quotient, then it will be helpful in attaining a lower incidence of musculoskeletal trauma. I define obedience quotient as cap a high obedience quotient as capacity to obey in the absence of being watched. That means you stop when the traffic lights go red, even if it's 9 p.m. and there's no other vehicle coming. That is the highest obedience quotient you can have. And the lowest one is to continue across the traffic light, even when it's red and you see other vehicles approaching the junction. And that way you invite accidents. It brings some musculoskeletal trauma that brings the patient to the operating table for internal fixation. Now it's important to note that when fractures have occurred, reduction and retention of the reduction will become necessary towards restoration of healthy movement. Operative or non-operative methods are options available, but the consensus now is that whenever there's no overriding contraindication, each patient should have his or her fractures. Each patient should have his or her fractures fixed. The fixation here could be internal or external. As the name suggests, external fixation is fraught with higher risk of infection because of connection with the outside. Whereas internal fixation carries the least risk, the lower a lower risk of infection, but a high chance that when there's infection, the patient will pay dearly for it because infected internal implants have catastrophic outcomes in patients than external fibrators. I belong to the AO group. AO for Association for Osteosynthesis, a body that believes in a philosophy that seeks early return to mobility and function for patients with fractures, even if this means fixing all fractures. I actually believe in fixing all fractures unless the patient is too sick or too ill to withstand surgery. The pursuit of absolute stability of fracture fragments, which is now only justifiable in displaced intraarticular fractures, should be effect affected with how damage the blood supply and surrounding such. The fixation of fractures at the middle three-fifths of a long bone, called the diaphysis in anatomy, should offer cognizant respect for length, alignment, and rotation. This profound this profound declaration stands at the core of the AO philosophy. We we'll now go on to look at what revolutionized fixation of fractures at the work of Gerhard Koncha, who in 1939 introduced the tram in glulary nails and had been improved upon to such an extent that patients can now ambulate out of their beds on the first day post stop. But these techniques are not without complications. More often than not, the fracture configuration determines the, de the device that will be used and the onus on the surgeon to ensure that union is encouraged to occur as speedily as possible. And you may need adjuncts such as cancellous bone grafting, as demonstrated in a study done by Bermuda AO, and that aids healing of fractures. So that at the end of the day, there's a, there's, you are able to beat the constant risk of failure of implant. If union is delayed, the implant you have put there has a chance of failing because fatigue fracture sets in. Every metal that is subjected to bending and straightening repeatedly undergoes fatigue and then breaks. I also need to mention that uh, no mechanic should ever leave a spanner in the engine block. And we all know the implication is a mechanic is a spanner in your engine block. And engine blocks make vehicles move. The musculoskeletal system also make people move. Therefore, no orthopedic surgeon to leave any equipment, any tool, any swap in a, in a patient. We are not like the general surgeon. With all due respect to the DVC academic who is presenting the VC today, they have a benevolent momentum that can always wrap itself around any such foreign body. 
and give the patient hope of survival. But for the orthopedic surgeon, once you have a foreign body, infection will be perpetuated until that foreign body is removed. The results of such imprudence have been reported repeatedly by the report by Omebese and Obemudia in this regard suffices. Now a few examples of what we have done, the patient with, I think the, the, the slides will speak for themselves. You have a patient with a fracture and then the fixation going on to union. Another patient, an elbow broken in pieces and then fixed after surgery. And then, of course, a, a young man who had gunshot, open gunshot, open fracture of the hip after fixation union. And then, of course, we have a patient with fracture of the shoulder ghetto. That is the, the fracture is passing through the glenoid. And, of course, it's comminuted union after internal fixation. And then, of course, a patient with diastasis of the pelvis. The superficial diastasis is here. The sacrilar joint is completely yanked out in put. And then, of course, after fixation. And then, I think that's enough for internal fixation. Let's go on to the artistry of correcting posteotomy, which is actually a core part of this discussion. But uh, I know I'm timing myself. I do not want to see the yellow card before I get to the end. So you permit me to be a little bit uh, uh, superficial. In details here. Yeah. So corrective was told to me in the hands of an orthopedic surgeon is a creative art in science when onlookers are deprived of the opportunity to witness the underlying processes related to the intervention. There ought to be nothing more artistic to most orthopedic surgeons than deformity correction because flesh is always compelled to assume the contour negotiated by bone. The orthopedic surgeon therefore could mold bones to desirable states. We looked at the traditional osteotomy that had been done while we were in training where the bones were cut across in a straight line and both tibia and fibula cut at the same level with horrendous results in some occasion, uh, there is on some occasion and we felt that something could be done about this. After studying the literature, we found that the dome osteotomy would be a better option and we then changed the orientation of the dome osteotomy. The dome osteotomy in the literature was a mediolateral dome. We had to convert that to an anterior posterior dome, as in a study done by Obermudia Bafo, Obermudia A, Obafo A, and Obermudia B. And we designed a new technique, a new dome osteotomy, to address this issue. And then, of course, because blunt disease is a common condition in our environment, we also designed a new, a new osteotomy to deal with blunt disease. We'll come to details of this shortly. And we also found out that following Fixations. The patients usually ended up with a lot with foot drop, and we had to change the point of osteotomy of the of the fibula from upper part of the fibula to the lower chest, and that completely controlled the incidence of foot drop as a result of peroneal nerve palsy in our practice. Thirty osteotomies and more were not witnessed any peroneal palsy. And then, of course, the next photograph tells you about the dome. That is the dome of still to be we now practice. You can see a line across like that. The bone has been cut in an inverted U-shaped form. And this part holds the distal fragment as if it's a vice, preventing the fragment from shifting. After correction, the leg is now straight, but you can see minimal displacement. And because of that, we, are, we dispensed with the need to use internal fixation for such procedures in children. The advantage this offers the child is that the child does not have a, a need for a second surgery. Because if you use internal fixation, you need to come back another day to remove the implant as the child grows. And these are examples of some of the cases. I consider this as the worst case I've ever seen. If you look at the right foot of this patient, it's facing backwards, it's the patient facing you. Our right foot is facing backwards. After surgery, that's the patient, both feet facing forward. That's the same patient. You can see her buttocks looking at you, and the right foot looking at the same direction as the buttocks, which is unusual. After surgery, the two heels are now facing the back. 
and then we have this young lady who could allow a, a, a big soccer ball to pass in between her legs, and then after surgery, there's correction. And then this young man with unilateral plant disease, so deformed and shorting that this right knee, which is not this right lower leg, which is normal, now needs to be bent for the patient to walk after surgery. And in time, the rickets can make out the frontal bossing, the protuberant abdomen, and after surgery and treatment for rickets, that is straight left. And then another girl with rickets. This deformity is pathognomonic for rickets. Once seen, the patient has rickets. It's as if a fierce wind is coming in from this end and bending this into a K and bending this into a bow. It's called wind swept deformity after surgery. Correct. And then, of course, another bow leg after surgery. Correct. We now come to a part that we regard as reconstruction. Reconstruction of limb deformities. If, if Gavril if Abramovich Elizarobe, a Soviet doctor based in Kogan, USR, USSR, invented the circular spinal fixator, which was named after him the Elizarobe device. And this device made multi planar correction of deformities possible. And the procedure would require patients to have as the pins in their limbs for as long as 100, 200, even 300 days. In the absence of control of infection, the patient is doomed to disaster. And so we now devise a means of controlling infection with a dressing that can be done once every week. And to achieve this, we first use 1% sivas of adiazine combined with chlorhexidine. And at the end, we were able to reduce pink tract infection from 45.2% in some series to 4.1% in our patients. And then we went on to use Sivas of Adiazine alone. Sivas of Adiazine is a commonly available material for dressing bone wound. And we got the same result, showing that it's effective. From then on, we're able to do our dressings once a week. And therefore, we're able to now have limb reconstruction. And I show you some of our results. Now, apologies to those who are not used to seeing wounds like this. I plead that you forgive me. In this patient, you have, we can see any the life of an animal is in his blood. I think that's in Leviticus. Now, this bone is deprived of blood supply, so it's dead, even though it's dead. And so we now have to do debrimore. Debrimore is the removal of dead tissue. After that, you can see the gap of soft tissue and bone that is non existent here. But the patient had the good fortune of a small vessel, the posterior tibial artery passing through, through this chunk of flesh, this small chunk of flesh, to perfuse the foot. So at the end of that procedure, we now had to use the laser device. You can see rings on the patient's limb, and that's what we had. We had transported bone and flesh from up to cover the defect. Another patient with you can see another patient with a bone gap. The x-ray here shows that from here to here, there's no bone. From this point to this point, there's no bone. You can see how thin the flesh is. And then, of course, we started what we call internal bone transport. We're actually transporting this patient's bone from here, down, down, until we got here. Now you can see a gap here where we transported the bone from. After two times the number of months it took us, new bone will form. And so you can see the bone has been formed here. The one we have transported are united here. And that is the patient. First, her very narrowed, the, the very narrow portion of her leg. And then, after correction and treatment. Now, this is how the procedure is done. We do a corticotomy. You can see a cut across the bone there. You can see the bone gradually being pulled down. And then, effectively, now docked. The word we use there is to dock, D-O-C-K. Yeah. And the bone is now docked here, a line union, and gradually bone forms here because you have not cut the blood vessels in the marrow. The 30 potent cells in the marrow will reform bone. Now, another case, shortening due to childhood disease, and then surgery. 
rather lengthening and final lengthening of the limb to the appropriate length. And then, of course, the device is not used for limb lengthening alone. It's also used for correction of other deformities because it can translate bone in any direction you want. So this patient came to us with a severe, with late or reduced dislocation of the knee. That's the X-ray. And then, of course, while so that's on the operating table, on the day of surgery, the laser rod device has been placed, and the device, if you look at the X-ray now, the bone is now straight. You look at this bone here, and look at the next one, there's now, it's now straight, in alignment. Of course, the patient, the, the pictures before, and then after. And then, of course, shortening with bow legs, and then correction. For this patient, we felt dissatisfied that we didn't get the results we actually wanted because we, we promised her that we would make her taller. We only succeeded in making the leg straight without giving her the extra high we had we discussed. Now, apart from things like this, we have also participated in other procedures like replacement of the hip joint after fractures of the femoral neck or vascular necrosis of the head or the femur. After a few observations, I realized that the posterolateral approach to the hip was not meant for me because I had seen a number of posterior dislocations to the point that I decided that I will embrace another approach. And so I embraced the lateral approach by McLaughlin and Hayes, frequently called the stracato approach to the hip. I will modify it to enable us to operate on uh, patients who have prevalent soft tissue contracture and osteoporosis. And by the time we had finished, we came to the conclusion that that design of a new approach is effective in treating our patients in spite of the severity of osteoporosis. And we had, this is a diagram of the, the modification. And then of course the cases, some of the cases we had done, a young man with bilateral vascular necrosis of a hip and has now had bilateral hip atrophy. I think he's in our midst, and uh, Desmond, uh, rise up for recognition. Thank you very much. And then, of course, an elderly patient with four years with fracture of the neck, hemiatroplasty done, that's the artificial hip there, the fractured neck. And then, of course, an elderly patient who had had hemiatroplasty done through the posterior lateral approach with a dislocation and erosion of the femoral of the acetabulum rather, and we now had to do bone grafting at the acetabulum, that's a bone graft held with screws and then cemented total hip replacement to allow the elderly woman to ambulate. <laughs> in most cases in orthopedic surgery, recall that I said I worked through, I worked with two masters, Professor Emeritus Ofegu and Professor Yuo Simen. They are masters in their own right. Of course, Professor PFA will maybe say my mentor is a master in his own right. Because I recall his advice to say, well, they are stay close to bone. And I always stayed close to bone. <laughs> and the meaning of that is that anytime you operate, get to the bone and remain there. Don't fish around anywhere else and you will come out safely. But I now realize that to get to the bone and remain there, the patient bled a lot. Until one day I found out that the floor in my theater took on the color of red. And I said, this couldn't have been anything else but blood. And so from that day onwards, I sought to find a solution. And we found that diluting adrenaline to one in 200,000 helped us to minimize blood loss during surgery as well as reactionary hemorrhage. And reactionary hemorrhage is that occurs within 24 hours of surgery after you have left the theater, that this could control it meant that at least our patients could have surgery without significant blood transfusion. We have actually had to operate on some patients without needing blood transfusion, orthopedics, and trauma. Okay. We also know that the natural means of controlling blood loss in, the, in orthopedics is to use a tourniquet. A tourniquet is any device you can tie proximal to a point to prevent blood from flowing. And the exerted pressure in the tissue may not be determinable. So we now devised a means of determining the pressure in the underlying tissue. 
and that's our device. We incorporated an, an, an aneroid speed underneath it a smart bandage so that as you turn the bandage, the stick will move to tell you that oh, the pressure in the tissue is 300 millimeters of mercury or less. The advisable pressure is 150 plus the systolic, systolic blood pressure of the patient so you don't exceed it and you don't cause harm. We then realized that for a surgeon who is busy, if you need to remove the tonic in one and a half hours, if it's not sterile, you cannot do it yourself. So we decided to use the sterile tonic aid. We now have a sterile smart bandage, a sterile tonic that enables us as surgeons to apply it and remove it because it's, it's sterile. And of course, an example of the outcome of using the tonic aid. We are doing a similar, a synovectomy here. That mop is essentially dry. If you consider what surgeons do, this is dry. And that is nearly dry. Because surgeons tend to have their hands in blood, except a few. I don't think I've uh, been elevated to the rank of those surgeons who are able to operate without blood coming out at all. Uh, maybe Professor Emeritus Profebu has that kind of experience. <laughs> diabetic foot ulcers. Of course, in the management of diabetic foot ulcers, we want to prevent the psychological trauma that comes with repeated amputation because you have done an amputation through a wrong point and the patient needs more. So, uh, working with Professor Mebese, Professor Mebese on Ubermudia in 1998, devised the Diabetic Food Severity Score to enable us to choose patients and decide those who will benefit from dressings and those who will benefit from primary amputation. And then, of course, an example of a diabetic food gangrene, uh, which can be avoided or prevented or deferred if the necessary measures are taken. Of course, there, there's an area where all surgeons should take note, post-operative documentation. Whatever is not written is not before anybody. Not even oral tradition can defend what is not written. In short, medical legally, nothing is defensible unless it's written. And we decided to study operation notes written by surgeons, particularly orthopedic surgeons. It's not as if the other surgeons fared better, but we felt that we should, we should dwell on our own side of the divide. And found out that most operation notes have significant omissions that would affect the safety of revision surgery. How would that affect safety of revision surgery? You have used 10 screws and you didn't write it down. The next man who's going to operate to remove the screws will not know how many screws he needs to remove. Because you say, why not use x-rays to scan? Unless the x-ray is taken in multi dimensions, you may miss a screw that is lying under a plate. And so it, to write it down is the best approach. And we found out that most notes didn't include those particular matters. And, that, and this could create medical legal issues for the hospital's legal team. And that is the best example of vicarious liability. Because if you pull on the pole, the pole will pull on the pier. So if we get to the hospital, if the surgeon does not do the right thing, and I think therefore, is one of the recommendations that should live here that there must be a means of ensuring that notes are written. If you computerize it and ensure that you cannot post it unless you have filled all the points, or operation notes are prepared and written out so that you must fill every point if you don't have the computer. And so we have come down to preventive orthopedics. This is the corpus orthopedus erga omnes because I've dwelt on the seasons and salutary symbiosis. This is the one that concerns us all. I'm not an architect, but I do know that buildings and our habits at home contribute largely to a number of patients that we operate on. A number of those patients who have patroplasty, had injuries at home, falls, and related matters. Some had fallen in hotel rooms, in the bathtub, because some basic things were not done. Whenever you are tired, there's nothing about it. You are human. Sit down and have your bath. If you sit down to have your bath, the only part that will not be washed will be your Botox. <laughs> and so that's, if you can then stand up and wash the Botox for last and go away, happy that you are okay. So you can use a stool or a chair in your bathroom if you are tired. A towel on the floor, a floor mat in your bathroom can be the difference between a disastrous fall and a happy emergence. 
from the bathroom. And then as we age, we should consider the use of rails in bathrooms, stairs, and entrances to homes. And then I have seen homes where you need to walk gingerly because the tiles on the floor are primarily slippery. In an environment where we eat okra, you imagine a situation where your house help mistakenly leaves a drop of okra on your sleeping tiles, maybe a foot away from your dining table. The young man who is 40 can survive it by some assaulting, after all, if our enemies do it. <laughs> so as he's falling in some assault land and goes away, but at 80 it's not possible. The person falls well, and with the aid of osteoporosis and osteomalacia, there's a fracture. And there's nothing as terrible. In short, it is better to fall in the hands of a physician when you are old than fall in the hands of an orthopedic surgeon. That is true. Because this physician will give you tablets, you will, your health is in your hands. You take the tablets, you are well. But when you fall in the hands of the orthopedic surgeon, your health is in his hands or her hands. The reverse is better because you take charge. Now let's look at another thing that is very important, exercise. The single most important prevention against osteoporosis is the bone stock we approach the village with. Now let's look at a situation where a, a, an average postmenopausal woman will lose one to 3.5% of her bone stock every year. So let's work with the midpoint, let's say two. That means if a woman gets to menopause at 50, at 70 she would have lost 40% of her bone stock. And if that woman had been sedentary, not participating in any form of exercise, as we almost always do because we are very busy, then she will approach menopause with maybe 60% of normal. You then remove 40% from 60. And that's, that will leave the patient with the person with 36% of normal. And we have a patient who, in an attempt to pick a box from the top of her wardrobe, broke the tibia. There was no other force, just to lean on one leg and pick a box. She came down, collapsed with a fracture of the tibia because she had not been used to exercise. And there are so many things that we don't do. So, Therefore, it's important that we start now. Teach your body, just like the Bible says, teach a child the way you should go when it grows, not depart. This time around, teach your body now that you are young the way it should go so that when you grow old, it will not depart. If you've been training for 20 to 30 minutes every day from the age of 25 till 70, it's not going to be at 71 that you now find it difficult to do. That's what is important, and it's never too late to change. It's never too late to embrace healthy lifestyles because the prayer of everyone is to have longevity. But longevity without health is not exactly what anyone prays for. It is healthy longevity that is useful. And not just healthy longevity, longevity with movement. <laughs> because you are healthy and you can't attend any function, you can't dance. In short, you cannot run around with your grandchildren. Why the other person is doing that? You are pointing walking sticks at young children because you can no longer move around. Therefore, it's important for us to consider what we can do as we grow old. Now, the sun and our musculoskeletal system is common knowledge that the sun is a partner in the synthesis of vitamin D, which is required for metabolism of calcium. When it's deficient in adult, it leads to osteomalacia. Of course, in children, it causes rickets that we are able to deal with. When osteomalacia coexists with osteoporosis in the same patient, then there's double jeopardy. That means the patient can sustain fractures at ease. When it is possible, therefore, a weak elderly patient should be exposed to the sun by his or her caregivers. Four to 15 minutes every morning. Thank God we are in a sunny place, in a sunny environment. And then, of course, thankfully, the early morning sun that is involved in helping us secrete vitamin D does not scorch. So there is no place where the early morning sun should scorch. And there is no excuse, therefore, to do that. But if you are building a house you intend to live in till old age, then let your dining room face the east. So that even if it is raining, while you are taking your breakfast, some sunshine will get through the windows to you. If you have not built, consider this. If it's not your dining room, it should be your bedroom. 
is either facing the east, if it's vitamin D you want, or you can face the west if it's clean air you want. Because vitamin the sun has ultraviolet rays as antimicrobial. And therefore the air in a room that is exposed to sunlight is cleaner than the air in a room that is completely shut from any, any chance of getting sunlight. No man or woman should live in a room that does not have the sun getting to it. And our traditional African architecture made that possible. Because you had the hotel odo. I don't know what architects call that now, but the hotel odo itself ensured that whether you were in the east, north, south, or west, there will be somewhere in your hotel odo where the sun will come down. Show that I play golf. <laughs> so now, uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, we have come this far. I want to make some recommendations. Um, in the construction of new works, I have not said demolish the old works. In the construction of new works, consideration should be given to access to sunlight in works. Sunscreen will then be used to shield the unit from the sun whenever necessary. The early morning sun is never harsh, so we can't claim that the patient will complain. Besides, the ultraviolet rays of the sun will make sure that the air in that world will be cleaner. The definitive treatment for all orthopedic surgeons or fractures has to be expeditiously taken. We compete with the traditional bone setters with due respect to them, but that ought not to be. Because if we agree that fractures should be fixed as expeditiously as possible, making sure that the sun does not set twice on a patient that has broken a bone, then the, the traditional bone setters will deal with sprains or possibly insect bites. Because every patient with a fracture knows that he has solutions. But in this setting where both the orthopedic surgeon and the traditional bone setter will keep his patient on the ward for six weeks, and the orthopedic surgeon has more expensive care, and then it's, it's a race, it's a competition we will never win until we adopt a faster, cheaper, more effective means of treating fractures. Because when they have embraced you with fractures, then when they have joint complaints, they will come to you. After all, one good turn deserves another. The National Health Insurance Scheme. I, I think in my own uh, opinion, and I'm, I'm going to say this, uh, could be better. I have seen patients who are NHIS needing to buy implants because it's not part of the coverage. I offer a man treatment for malaria that he may be able to, while in service, afford, and leave him to spend hundreds of thousands in treating conditions that he cannot afford. And so it has to be improved to include implants all kinds of surgeries. If it means government and the uh, staff adding a little more, so be it. Because what we have now actually could lead to a situation where the patient pays so much that there is acute exacerbation of absence of money in the pocket that our class, the class of 89, would have called jocularly acute on chronic pocketitis. <laughs> And then why can't we manufacture implants? The Nigerian spirit in us will make it possible for us to manufacture implants. And the government should make that possible by at least giving pioneer status to companies and allowing them task breaks that will encourage them to produce these things. These companies will be indigenous or be, foreign, will be partners to foreign parents. Why are teaching hospitals not endowed with clinical acquisition skills? There are so many teaching hospitals that don't have clinical acquisition skills. What I mean is, why should a house officer graduate without knowing how to suture, how to do a few operations? What we now have is a situation where, in the absence of clinical acquisition skills, the undergraduates are nowadays turned into second-hand spectators in the theater, looking at the back of the surgeon and hoping to see what is ongoing. It's not surprising, therefore, that the majority of house officers of these days are unable to exercise the same adroitness as house officers of yesteryears. 
A clinical acquisition center in every teaching hostel will change this. Because you then have a place you can take your students to as a lecturer, teach them these skills without placing the patient's life in danger. And then, of course, the student is the power. <laughs> Government at all levels, or through their parents, that should restore the school health program so that it will be possible to screen children for things like rickets and other conditions that will improve outcome. Because it would appear as if uh, parents are left to themselves and the, and the school teachers. Uh, if, if, a, if a school health program is instituted, it will, it will improve at least the state and status of our children. Now we also need to look at improved funding. There are different ways of doing it. Thank God the representative of His Excellency the Governor is here and he heads the PPP office. You could actually have collaboration between industries and government where the industry will provide it. A company provides the CM that UBTH is using or provides tool three, employs technicians to operate it and then maintains it for a nominal fee. If UBTH is charging 40000 for the procedure, the company gets maybe ten or 15 to ensure that it's able to maintain the staff per procedure. That company will get more money if it's encouraged to do 100 instead of 10. You then create a situation where we have a win-win situation that will ensure that this explosion in medical tourism go down. You can't tell a man not to seek the best care possible on earth if he has the money. But if that best care is affordable and available in his backyard, he would rather stay than travel. There also should be no blanket ban on overseas clinical attachment. Because in my stints abroad, I realized that, yes, we have read things, but there are so many things we have not seen. And not, no fault of us, no fault of government. You can't ask the man, the government to scratch itself beyond its capacity. And so, if you have room for overseas clinical attachment, people will acquire skills that will change how we practice if private partnership enables the equipment to be there. I also recommend that as a nation as a system, and a system, we should embrace what I have termed the reverse fellowship. I call, the reverse, I call it the reverse fellowship. That the normal fellowship we know is that you travel abroad. There should be a reverse fellowship where people who are skilled, that are abroad in other hostels where they have acquired requisite skill, can come back and spend a month or two. If somebody spends a month every year teaching people, in five years, the people would have spent five months with the person coming down with one or two person. I think that is cheaper. Not I think, I know that would be cheaper than sending 20 members of the Department of Orthopedics abroad, one for every year, for five years. It would be more expensive than bringing four persons every month or every two months from somewhere in the United Kingdom. They have pro, there are so many Nigerians everywhere who have homes in Nigeria that I don't think are actually so afraid of Nigeria that they won't come home. They come every Christmas. And so if you give them necessary incentive, only Christmas Day will be their holiday. <laughs> now, we're we'll back to where we started from, teamwork. Give me about five minutes, too. No single finger can pick lice from the hair. It is impossible. The best you can do is to attach glue to it, and when it picks it, you can't break it, you can't drop it. That is the same way I see teamwork. Members of the healthcare team to exercise some restraint. Have a routine. And then let us deal with this matter the way two hands wash each other. We all know that the dominant hand is the one that enters the pot of soup or the plate. But at the end of the exercise, it invites the non-dominant hand, whether you're left-handed or right-handed, to come and do the washing, and it gladly does so. What I'm saying, therefore, for the good of the system, let us join hands together to make the system move forward, regardless of which hand has the higher share or bigger share of the pie. In this lecture, I would like to declare that the Nigerian is an extra gifted subtype of human. Otherwise, the results you see from Nigerian hospitals and academics would not have been possible considering the multifactorial constraints 
and restraints they have to surmount in order to deliver on promises made to patients, clients, or students. I salute, therefore, the ingenuity of the Nigerian spirit as depicted by the orthopedic surgeons and traumatologists who produce day in, day out outstanding results. What I have brought before you today is a tip of the iceberg in industry and outcome by orthopedists nationwide. The sound of the mortar on a pestle in another man's kitchen is of no use to the famished. <laughs> now that means, in my own opinion, that whatever they are able to do abroad, whatever, whether it's teamwork, everything, will be of no use to us unless we domesticate them. And that is our collective duty, government and the people put together. There is never any sight of grain harvest where some grains will not be left inadvertently in the field. In this light, therefore, I apologize to those patients who receive less than the optimal outcomes I planned to offer with the understanding that for their sakes, I pledge to do better and to do more work in pursuit of new summits in academic and healthcare excellence as I call to mind my modest achievements as stepping stones for marching onwards. Just as whistling is impossible with a mouthful of water, so is running forward at competitive pace impossible to anyone who persistently looks back. On we make up. Thank you, your mouse. But here we see.
Thank you very much. In no particular, that we want to recognize some dignitaries present. Permit me to quickly recognize the presence of uh, Emeritus Professor Anyam Uwanto. Emeritus Professor and Professor Mrs. Ofwebu. Emeritus Professor Aroho Elam. Professor Inya Adebe OFR. May I recognize our very own CMT, the man that is so proud of the inaugural lecturer. When he was delivering his lecture, the CMT looked at him and looked at Mrs. O'Merigi and told Mrs. O'Merigi, that man is from my constituency. <laughs> Professor Michael Ibadim, CMT UBTH, who want to recognize you. We also want to recognize a very special man. No wonder the inaugural lecturer tried his best to impress him. I am referring to the father-in-law of our inaugural lecturer, Mr. Clifford Ogiami. You gave your daughter to a trusted man. No wonder you were shaking your daughter. I said, Madam, you chose well. We want to recognize the presence of our very own number one man in Edo State, the man that is performing and his work is speaking for him. I mean, our governor. He is here, ably represented by Mr. Ike Osayende. He is an alumnus of this institution. He is the Iase of Benin Kingdom. Chief Dr. Sam Iase. I also want to recognize the presence of a one-time Deputy Vice-Chancellor Administration. Currently, the Pro-Chancellor and Chairman Governing Council of Rizali University is Royal Highness Professor G. Akenzoa. He is here. He did not send a representative. Please join me welcome, Honorable Patrick Obayako. Of Ogada, 
successful woman, there is a man. Thank you very much for your understanding and may God bless you. We are not trying to meet anybody. Wherever you are seated, the university is glad to receive you here in this 190th edition of the inaugural lecture. Immediately after this session, the inaugural lecturer is inviting us to St. Albert's Hall for a very wonderful reception for our guests. Students, you already know that we are very, very courteous people. Don't go there because your own is not there. He has decided to give your refreshment where you can have some level of sun rays. And so you must eat at the hotel hodo so that you can be the most. And so for our students immediately after the Procession, we shall let you know where you will be taking your own reception. Please, we want to appeal at every inaugural lecture, unless the procession leaves, we are still on. It is a civilized society and we must treat it as such. And so, we want to request that we please rise and take the Unibene anthem, the national anthem, and then the procession begins, led by the Vice Chancellor, Unibene anthem.
last chancellor leads the procession out of the auditorium.